section twenty four of captain cook by walter besant this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter thirteen the ship's company we can learn more about the individual officers and men belonging to cook's three expeditions than would be expected by reading the journals of the voyages cook himself tells us nothing of his officers except in connection with special service when he is always ready to give them credit there are no private letters preserved for the simple reason that it is no use writing letters when there is no post we cannot ascertain the grumblings of the forecastle or the criticisms of the wardroom but something may be recovered from the journals themselves and there was as we have seen the narrative of george forster and the journal of gilbert also there are the books of ellis sidney parkinson the draughtsman brought by banks and one or two more from reading which one acquires some knowledge of the officers in general terms cook makes known his solicitude for the welfare of his crew he tells us how directly they got into cold weather he had the sleeves of their jackets lengthened with bays and gave them caps made of the same warm material he dilates on the grand antiscorbutic effects of his malt his sauerkraut and his portable broth he prides himself on his preservation of the crew from scurvy we have seen how he made a kind of tea for the men from the leaves and twigs of the spruce how he had celery and scurvy grass boiled in the peas and wheat though the men at first would not eat them how he made beer out of the sugar-cane and when the men refused it knocked off their grog we see how he sends out the young gentlemen on shooting parties and allows them to accompany the scientific men on their botanical expeditions we cannot but remark how careful he is to mention any officer who does any special service and when he loses his surgeon william anderson it is not a formal entry in the log that records his death but a careful tribute to his worth and his attainments that shows his justice and his desire to give to every man the credit due to his zeal and knowledge but when the ship's beef is so rank that it can no longer be eaten even by the strongest stomach when the biscuit is half eaten and wholly defiled by the cockroaches when the crew is weakened by privation and bad food when half the ship's company are down through having eaten poisonous fish the captain says nothing these things were part and parcel of such a voyage those who cannot endure them had better not come a-sailing on the broad pacific sufficient happiness for them to escape the dreadful scurvy and to come home again at length alive once or twice it is true he mentioned things which have reached to pass beyond any previous experience we learn for instance on one occasion how the ship was pestered with cockroaches whose number could not be kept down they swarmed everywhere at night they made everything in the cabin seem to be moving about by their multitudes they devoured the ink on labels and letters they even climbed up into the rigging and when the sails were unfurled they fell in thousands on the deck the surgeon mr anderson discovered that there were two kinds the blotta germanica a daylight companion and the blotta orientalis their joy by night but this discovery brought no comfort to the crew as it could not help to get rid of them and the cockroaches although named and classified went on multiplying again certain fish the captain says which were eaten by the officers and the petty officers caused a violent pain in the head and bones with a scorching heat of the skin and a numbness in the joints it was a week or ten days before all the gentlemen recovered forster's account of the same misfortune shows what a narrow escape they all had of being poisoned our ship now resembled an hospital the poisoned patients were still in a deplorable situation they continued to have gripes and acute pains in all their bones in the daytime they were in a manner giddy and felt a great heaviness in their heads at night as soon as they were warm in bed their pains redoubled and robbed them actually of sleep the skin peeled off from the whole body and pimples appeared on their hands 
those who were less affected with pains were much weaker in proportion and crawled about the decks emaciated to mere shadows we had not one lieutenant able to do duty and as one of the mates and several of the midshipmen were likewise ill the watches were commanded by the gunner and the other mates one would think that so severe a visitation would have called for more than a mere note of passing sickness it may be judged from forster's journal with how much heart the people including even the scientific men on board endured these privations and suffered this hardness we can see the captain his face set southwards looking over the heads of the hungry and discontented crew he is thinking how he can break through the wall of ice and learn what is beyond they are wondering how long it will be before the captain will give up this foolishness and turn back to warmer climates the officers and passengers shared as forster plainly tells us in the general dejection their store of special provisions had long since vanished and they were now reduced to the fare of the common sailors the hope of meeting with new lands had vanished the topics of common conversation were exhausted the cruise to the south could not present anything new but appeared in all its chilling horrors before us the conversation and opinions of columbus's crew have only partly been preserved but such as they were such were those of cook's officers and scientific passengers they were ready to exchange all their chances of glory in the discovery of the terra australis incognita for another month at otaheite among the fruits and the blooming beauties of that island many other instances will be found by him who reads not only the voyages themselves but also the books which belong to them and surround them as the big fish is attended by the little fish always it is the same thing the captain endures and murmurs not the men endure and grumble as one makes his way through these volumes a personal interest as i have already said is presently awakened in the officers some of them begin to stand out clear of outline we see their faces we hear their voices among these is captain clark he who follows at cook's heels in the discovery he is a silent shade and pensive he carries out instructions and endures hardships uncomplaining even though perhaps because the hand of death is upon him when his chief is killed he is carried already in the last stage of consumption on board the resolution to die in a few more weeks another who stands out a clear and well-defined figure is that of anderson the surgeon who picked up the language everywhere compiled the vocabularies and wrote these admirable reports on the manners and customs of the people one of the earliest and best of anthropologists next to the captain the man most zealous and eager for the success of the expedition he died before his chief then comes king who wrote the conclusion of the journal king whom the natives loved and called tinny a man of genial and winning manners a favourite with all he came home in command of the discovery they made him a post captain but four years after his return he died in the south of france then there is gore who succeeded clark in the command we see a good deal of gore he is always going off with boats sounding surveying examining a capable officer but apparently since king wrote the journals not gifted with the pen of the ready writer he died in seventeen ninety one of the captains of greenwich hospital there are also those stout fellows roberts the first lieutenant phillips who behaved with so much pluck at the murder of the captain samwell the surgeon edgecombe the marine there are the two forsters grumbling and discontented the amiable youth sidney parkinson draughtsman who died monkhouse the surgeon who died charles green the astronomer who died sparman the naturalist whom we remember emerging from the bush where the natives had stripped him of everything but his spectacles as for gilbert from whose log i have quoted he is a voice and nothing more he was transferred from one ship to the other on his return home he was promoted with the rest 
but as i have said already he died shortly afterwards of smallpox i have mentioned isaac smith the boy whom cook took with him his wife's cousin midshipman on his first and mate on his second voyage after his second voyage he was made lieutenant and continued in active service till the year seventeen ninety four when his health gave way and he retired receiving the rank of admiral in the year eighteen o four he was the first englishman who landed in australia when the captain went ashore he took the boy with him now then isaac he said you go first and the lad jumped ashore admiral smith after his retirement lived with his cousin the widow there are one or two of the crew who deserve mention the old and faithful watman who followed cook on the third voyage never weary of the sea has already been mentioned it was an ill service that he did his master in dying at the juncture when the natives were trying to believe the strangers to be all gods and superior to death next there is corporal ledyard the gallant marine who next to anderson developed the greatest quickness in learning the language wherever they touched he was by birth an american and in the year seventeen eighty six he formed the project of walking across the continent of america for that purpose he thought he would journey through europe and across siberia to kamchatka where their russian friends of their last visit would perhaps take him across the straits sir joseph banks and others raised a sum of fifty pounds for him with this slender provision he sailed to hamburg and thence to copenhagen and stockholm he thought to find the gulf of bothnia frozen over as it was not he walked all round it through tornia to st petersburg here he found a convoy of military stores about to start for the use of one billings who had been in one of cook's expeditions and had now taken service with the russians being employed in making surveys for the russian government on the northwest coast of america he obtained permission to join this convoy and in august reached the town of irkutsk in siberia thence he proceeded to yakutsk where he met with captain billings he returned to irkutsk intending to pass the winter there but in january he was arrested brought back under the guard of an officer and two soldiers in a post sledge from moscow he was then taken to the frontier and dismissed with the empress's prohibition ever to set foot within her territories what harm this poor soldier sailor could possibly do to the empire of russia is not apparent sir joseph banks heard from him from Königsberg. he died in seventeen ninety and his adventurous life has been written and may be read one feels a certain sympathy too with the irishman who had been in the danish service and somehow seemed to have no country left so that when he ran away with the intention of remaining away for the rest of his life a general compunction was felt for him and though he was brought back his punishment was no more than a fortnight in irons many tried to run away a sailor in new zealand enticed from his duty by a girl a midshipman and a sailor in otaheite thinking that life on such an island was better far than to go on ploughing the barren wave they were caught too but not severely punished cook was hard but he could feel for those weaknesses of human nature which did not interfere with the proper discharge of work lastly two men ran away with a six-oared gig but this was off macau they were never heard of again one pictures the reception which these misguided and unhappy sailors would meet with from the chinese mariners who should chance upon them and their six-oared gig one more reminiscence of the voyages it is christmas day the ship is in latitude sixty five degrees south it is midsummer so the nights are short but the skies and seas are hidden with continual fog so that nothing can be seen around or above the vessel is in the midst of ice a wall of ice is before them broken ice floating ice ice in small lumps and in great hills all about them for months the crew have been saving up their brandy in readiness for this sacred day which they keep by all getting drunk very drunk says the historian though the captain passes over the occurrence on the discipline of the ship a good deal might be said but cook must not be judged by the practice of modern days 
the sailors get drunk unrebuked on christmas day that would not be permitted in these days when the ship was in port things were allowed to go on board which can hardly now be related they may be found in great detail in forster's book at sea a stern rule prevailed and the lash was freely used on shore and in port the men did what they pleased those who know who went down on board the royal george with brave kempenfeld will understand that cook followed the usual practice certain things he said i permitted because i could not prevent them there might have been one feels some restrictions an attempt at restraint but there were none it was exactly the same with wallace one more point of difference i know not when every ship began to carry its chaplain but there was no chaplain on any of cook's voyages it was however the custom for the captain to read the service to the whole crew on sunday mornings the bible from which cook read the lessons during his last voyages was given to his widow who used no other during the rest of her long life it is a well-bound quarto edition basket oxford seventeen sixty five and is now in sydney with other relics of the great navigator end of section twenty four section twenty five of captain cook by walter besant this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter fourteen the last it seems idle to add anything concerning the character of james cook to what has gone before he was hard to endure true to carry out his mission perfectly loyal and single-minded he was fearless he was hot-tempered and impatient he was self-reliant he asked none of his subordinates for help or for advice he was temperate strong and of simple tastes he was born to a hard life and he never murmured however hard things proved and like all men born to be great when he began to rise with each step he assumed as if it belonged to him the dignity of his new rank a plain man those who knew him say but of good manners if this volume does not show the manner of the man then it has failed such as his achievements required such he was let us however once more repeat briefly what those achievements were because they were so great and splendid and because no other sailor has ever so greatly enlarged the borders of the earth he discovered the society islands he proved new zealand to be two islands and he surveyed its coasts he followed the unknown coast of new holland for two thousand miles and proved that it was separated from new guinea he traversed the antarctic ocean on three successive voyages sailing completely round the globe in its high latitudes and proving that the dream of the great southern continent had no foundation unless it was close around the pole and so beyond the reach of ships he discovered and explored a great part of the coast of new caledonia the largest island in the south pacific next to new zealand he found the desolate island of georgia and sandwich land the southernmost land yet known he discovered the fair and fertile archipelago called the sandwich islands he explored three thousand five hundred miles of the north american coast and he traversed the icy seas of the north pacific as he had done in the south in search of the passage which he failed to discover all this without counting the small islands which he found scattered about the pacific again he not only proved the existence of these islands but he was in advance of his age in the observations and the minute examination which he made into the religion manners customs arts and language of the natives wherever he went it was he who directed these inquiries and he was himself the principal observer when astronomical observations had to be made it was he who acted as principal astronomer he was as much awake to the importance of botany especially of medicinal plants as he was to the laying down of a correct chart it is certain that there was not in the whole of the king's navy any officer who could compare with cook in breadth and depth of knowledge in forethought in the power of conceiving great designs and in courage and pertinacity in carrying them through let us always think of the captain 
growing only more cheerful as his ship forced her way southwards though his men lay half starved and half poisoned on the deck his voyages would have been impossible his discoveries could not have been made but for that invaluable discovery of his whereby scurvy was kept off and the men enabled to remain at sea long months without a change i have called attention to the brief mention he makes of privation and hardships he barely notes the accident by which half his company was poisoned by fish he says nothing about the men's discomforts when their biscuit was rotten these things you see are not scurvy one may go hungry for a while but recover when food is found and is none the worse one gets sick of salt junk but if scurvy is averted mere disgust is not worth observation to drive off scurvy to keep it off was the greatest boon that any man could confer upon sailors cook has the honour and glory of finding out the way to avert this scourge those who have read of this horrible disease the tortures it entailed the terror it was on all long voyages will understand how great should be the gratitude of the country to this man since the disease fell chiefly upon the men before the mast it was fitting that one who had also in his youth run up the rigging to the music of the boatswain's pipe should discover that way and confer that boon the gratitude of cook's country was shown in several ways all rather curious had he been a member of a noble family his son would certainly have been raised to the peerage as he was not the king granted his family a coat of arms i think that this must have been the last occasion when a coat of arms was granted as a recognition of service in these days if a man wants a coat of arms he gets someone who understands heraldry to draw him one or to find him one or perhaps he ignorantly tries to make one for himself a coat of arms such a grant seems now to mean nothing we think we can confer gentility upon ourselves as indeed for all practical purposes we can but not of the ancient kind the old notion that gentility can be conferred by the sovereign as the fountain of honour is clean forgotten but it was not then forgotten no man could make himself armiger cook's family therefore was rewarded with his shield they were advanced to the first step of nobility the shield is thus described azure between the two polar stars or a sphere on the plain of the meridian showing the pacific ocean his track thereon marked by red lines and for crest on a wreath of the colours is an arm bowed in the uniform of a captain of the royal navy in the hand is the union jack on a staff proper the arm is encircled by a wreath of palm and laurel a very noble shield indeed a pension of two hundred pounds a year was bestowed upon the widow and the government further bestowed upon her half the profits arising from the publication of her husband's journal of the third voyage she also received a share in the profits of the journal of the second voyage but in both cases the interest alone was to be hers for life the children to receive the principal after her death at their death the principal was paid to her mrs cook was thus left fully provided for it only remains to tell the story of the fate which fell upon cook's children as well as upon himself there were six children in all three died in infancy or in tender years three grew up to manhood of these the eldest james was in the navy the second nathaniel also went into the navy the third and youngest hugh was sent to cambridge where he entered at christ's college in the year seventeen ninety three the news of her husband's death reached the unhappy widow in the first week of october seventeen eighty in the same week her second son nathaniel went down on board the thunderer in a hurricane off jamaica the news reached her before the end of the year then followed a period of thirteen years during which she saw her eldest son from time to time a gallant and active officer always on service and educated the youngest boy hugh in july seventeen ninety three this son as i have said was entered as a pensioner at christ's and went into residence in october two months later he was attacked by scarlet fever and died on december twenty first in his eighteenth year 
a portrait of this unfortunate youth in the possession of canon bennett shows a face of very remarkable beauty and delicacy with none of the severity which belonged to that of his father only five weeks later another blow fell upon the hapless woman already bereaved of husband and five out of her six children her eldest son who had been in the autumn of seventeen ninety three promoted to the rank of commander was while with his ship at pool in dorsetshire appointed to the command of the spitfire sloop of war on january twenty fourth seventeen ninety four he received from captain yeo commanding officer of the station his letters and orders to take command without delay he started immediately in an open boat manned by sailors returning from leave to sail from pool to portsmouth it was in the afternoon his boat was rather crowded there was a strong ebb tide and a fresh wind it was growing dark this was the last scene of james cook the younger for he never reached his ship what happened will never now be known his body with a wound on the head and stripped of all his money and valuables was found on the beach at the back of the isle of wight the boat was also found broken up but no trace of any of the crew was discovered perhaps they were drowned perhaps they murdered the captain made for the island laid his body on the beach broke up the boat and dispersed the body was brought over to portsmouth and taken to cambridge where it was laid in the same grave with the remains of his brother hugh overwhelmed by this final blow the unhappy woman was prostrated with an illness of mind and body which kept her to her house for two years when she recovered she asked her cousin admiral isaac smith who was unmarried to live with her they took a home together at clapham where she continued to live until her death in eighteen thirty five being then ninety-three years of age by her own request she was buried with her two sons in the center aisle of st andrew's church cambridge she kept her faculties to the end my informant describes her as a handsome and venerable lady her white hair rolled back in ancient fashion always dressed in black satin with an oval face an aquiline nose and a good mouth she wore a ring with her husband's hair in it and she entertained the highest respect for his memory measuring everything by his standard of honour and morality her keenest expression of disapprobation was that mr cook to her he was always mr cook not captain would never have done so like many widows of sailors she could never sleep in high wind for thinking of the men at sea and she kept four days in the year of solemn fasting during which she came not out of her own room they were the days of her bereavements the days when she lost her husband and her three boys she passed those days in prayer and meditation with her husband's bible and for her husband's sake she befriended their nephews and grandnephews and nieces and grandnieces of his whom she never saw they were not suffered to want with her pension and her share of the profits of the books and with other things such as the inheritance of her sailor son's fortune sworn under five thousand pounds mrs cook became a wealthy woman her house was good and filled with old furniture of the style called louis quinze it was also crowded and crammed in every room with relics curiosities drawings maps and collections brought home from the voyages it would seem that the government gave back the drawings and charts after they had been published on thursdays she always entertained her friends to dinner which was served at three o'clock after the death of her cousin the admiral she was taken care of by a faithful old servant whom she remembered in her will and by younger members of her own family footnote for these personal recollections of mrs cook and also for various documents connected with her husband's domestic life i am indebted to canon bennett of maddington vicarage devises as he is probably the only survivor of her personal friends this information could not have been procured from any one else without it the history of cook's private life would have been indeed shadowy End footnote. the greater part of the relics preserved were sent to the colonial government museum sydney after the colonial exhibition but the log of the first voyage and the gold medal conferred on the captain by the royal society are in the british museum 
the following genealogy shows the numbers and the end of cook's family all as has been seen were cut off in youth or infancy and no descendant now survives of england's greatest navigator james cook married elizabeth bates born 1742 died 1835 james born 1763 died 1794 nathaniel born 1764 died 1780 hugh born 1776 died 1793 elizabeth born 1766 died 1771 joseph born and died 1768 george born and died 1772 the end end of section 25 recording by pamela nagami in encino california september 2018 end of captain cook by walter besant